Com. Yes, sir. Mr. Com comes from uh, Analog Devices. Uh, he is the director of IoT technology for Analog Devices. And he's probably going to touch upon a slightly different implementation where he talks about his fab and how IoT and similar technologies are being used there. So maybe a different flavor, but maybe a similar outcome. So welcome, Com. So good afternoon, everybody. And, and I do realize that I'm standing between you all and lunch. So I'll um, attempt to be as quick as I can to kind of talk, uh, go through this today. So I'm going to take a, I'm actually going to set a timer for myself. So I don't run off track. Maybe I'm not. There we go. OK. OK. So, um, so today, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, you know, analog devices and what we do, and also, you know, to share some of the insights that as we kind of navigate this journey through IoT, what we're learning along the way and how we're leveraging some of that capabilities, either for our own manufacturing and also for, for customers. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about who we are, uh, what we do. Um, I will be brief on this. Um, I want to say a little bit about sensor to cloud, you know, value creation, smart partitioning in IoT. I actually did a talk here last year about that, um, if you're interested in learning more about that. But it's kind of one of the key things that underpins the type of work we do. Um, it's worth sort of spending some time just in, in the area of smart manufacturing, kind of just reviewing the state of play today. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about a case study that we are actively running right now internally in our fab, right, in, in one of our wafer fabs. And things we're learning from that and, and how we're going to apply that as we create value for our customers. So there's one specific area around condition-based monitoring or machine health that's, um, that we've learned, I think, is, is an area that is Im incredibly important these days in manufacturing and an area that we're focusing on for product development today. And then I'll say a bit about analytics and all of this, and, and then finally summarize. So just a bit about what we do, right? So Analog Devices is a company that's been around for 50 years. We're primarily known as a semiconductor company. We build signal processing and data conversion products. And you know, our goal really is about interpreting um, you know, the world around us and bridging the physical and digital, digital divides. And this is something we've been doing for, like I said, 50 years. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, that you know, IoT, or sorry, ADI kind of really values technology. We're a very technology-driven company. But if, if there's one thing that IoT is teaching us, right, um, is that we all need to learn, right? And, and there's no stop to it, right? If you don't learn, you die, as they say in some circles. So, you know, in conferences like this and the ability to, you know, listen to pre the previous speakers we hear today from Microsoft and GE, I mean, are very insightful and all um, um, help us learn. And so hopefully I can share some insights with you here today. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the information journey. It's one of the things we think a lot about, you know, as we sort of enable customers. So to a large extent, our technologies are on the left-hand side here today. We, we do a really good job, I think, sensing, gathering data, measuring, um, and then sending that information um, you know, on for further processing. But as you kind of move to, from left to right across the signal chain from the sensors and right at the physical edge to into the cloud and you know, or, um, where you're doing analytics, I mean, there is an information journey here. You're basically collecting data and then you're progressively processing that more and more to gain and generate insights for customers. Right? And, and that's a key piece of you know, what IoT technologies enable, uh, the ability to kind of you know, really kind of accelerate and automate a lot of this process. So one of the areas that we've kind of looked at, I mean, if you think about you know, the area of smart partitioning. So you know, we've heard today already references to gigabytes and terabytes of data that get gathered. Right? Now, the challenge with that, when you move data right, from network edge devices to the cloud, well, first of all, there are many cases um, where you know, and some stats that would say that 80% of the data that gets, you know, collected gets ignored, right? So it's pretty useful. It's not serving any value. When you're dealing with building kind of highly optimized edge and sensing solutions, especially systems that run off batteries, you can't afford to be wasting power or sending data that's not valuable, okay? And so, you know, the model that we've kind of adopted is this kind of, you know, um, smart partition area where we, you know, take advantage of our low-power microcontrollers and, and also uh, sometimes other companies as well to do a lot of local signal processing. And then we sort of generate insights on our edges, and on our device edges, and send them up to the cloud for, for, for further processing. So an example over in our booth today, if you take a look at our smart parking, is a really good example of this, where a lot of the data analytics and video analytics are done on our edge processing. Um, but I'm going to talk about that a little more in, with respect to condition-based monitoring in a moment. So, I mean, there's a lot of different opportunities. I mean, you know, some of these we're all probably tired about hearing the different opportunities in IoT. 
the two areas that I'm going to focus on today are condition monitoring and, and sort of connected factory type applications. So, I mean, you know, the area of kind of industrial automation, one thing that's very clear about it is, is it's incredibly complex, right? There's a lot to it and, um, you know, and I think the, um, you know, one of the challenges we have as a semiconductor in order to be able to continue to add value for our company, for our customers, is we need to learn about these applications. And it's been a cornerstone of ADI for many years that, um, you know, we actually learn a lot about the end applications our customers' problems are trying to solve and therefore, you know, can continue to add value. So let's just take a moment and review the state of play of manufacturing today, right? So, you know, you hear a lot about condition monitoring, you know, predictive maintenance and so on. But I think, you know, from this Lux study back in um, earlier this year, I mean, you know, about only half the manufacturers today are, you know, have not implemented predictive maintenance programs. All right, so that's a pretty, when you think about IoT in this audience, that's actually fairly, fairly um, um, a scary, or maybe not a scary number, but it's kind of in interesting to see. You know, for manufacturers that have implemented, um, you know, today's maintenance programs, they're still largely manual. You've got operators that are going around reading dials, maybe doing measurements. We do that ourselves and so, or have been doing that on some of our manufacturing. You know, we, manufacturing generally lags behind industry, industry and heavy, or energy and the heavy industry sectors. So we heard about locomotives and jet engines. Those are good examples of today where, you know, IoT technologies are being deployed. Um, and, you know, 75% of organizations that have deployed predictive maintenance programs have reported positive R ROI, right? So it sort of encourages people to do this. And 66%, you know, who, ha you know, have reported that, you know, deploying predictive maintenance programs has reported improve improvements in the factory um, operation and, break and the breakdown frequency. And then finally, you know, culture is a big thing, right? I mean, you know, when you're on a manufacturing line and dealing with operators, I mean, they don't want to touch something that's working. So if it looks fine, they're not going to touch it. And, and that's a very sort of, that's a mindset that often plays against, you know, kind of adding new sort of technologies into a manufacturing environment. Because as soon as you touch something and something shifts, even if it's nothing to do, the new technology gets blamed. So, and then, you know, only 44% of manufacturers are comfortable with remote monitoring over the internet. So the whole area of security, data privacy is really what's underpinning this here. A lot of factory and plant owners do not want to send their data outside of their own kind of, you know, um, on-premises systems. So, and maintenance, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg, right? So, I mean, one of the other areas that's of interest here is um, energy uses. So, you know, motors actually consume about 40% of, 45% of all global electricity, which is a pretty staggering number. And you look at the breakdowns in industrial and building technology, 78 and 43%, you know, are, you know, of energy use goes into, you know, motor-based systems. And, you know, it's been shown that a reliable predictive maintenance system can actually reduce energy consumption by 14%, according to the U.S. Department of Energy. So those, it's not just about maintenance when you think about these predictive maintenance systems, right? So let me jump to our example, right? So, um, you know, ADI, this is one of our wafer fab. It's actually based in Limerick, Ireland. We have two in, um, here in Limerick and Wilmington, Massachusetts, as well as other large manufacturing plants in the Philippines, right? So, um, you know, so one of the things that, um, you know, we're doing here is we actually use this particular plant to build some of our precision systems, right, and, and semiconductors. And so now we're actually using this as a test case to actually kind of use these semiconductors to basically, you know, um, monitor our own systems and improve our own um, 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 production capabilities. So the goal here with these projects is really to kind of move from a traditional approach of maintenance to be more predictive and proactive rather than reactive. You know, we're adding prediction into our existing system, and as we'll see in a minute, there's a lot of existing uh, plant here. One of the issues we have is that all of our fabs and plants run very close to capacity. We actually have a very efficient manufacturing operation, right? So the challenge with that is that if you have a scrap event, like you have to throw out a lot of wafers for some reason, you then have to go back to the end of, start of the queue to, to restart those wafers, which has big impacts on customer deliveries. If we promise something, you know, three, six months out, and all of a sudden you've got to start it, you know, you're introducing several months of delays for customers, which is a, which is a real problem, right? And then, you know, we also want to improve, you know, the operating efficiency of the equipment itself, and uh, as well as using this as a test bed for our own IoT technologies. So let me say, say a little bit about the Limerick plant, right? Um, you know, we've been building, you know, semiconductor parts here now for, I think, close to 30 years. It's not, or, sorry, I, almost 40 years. I think we opened the plant in 1978, right? Now, there's equipment there that isn't that old, but, you know, I think one of the things about this is that, you know, We've got lots of different tool types. We run mostly CMOS on 8-inch wafers through this with also some passive devices and some bipolar and CMOS mixes, um, and all in very clean, you know, um, you know, very low particle count clean rooms, right? Pretty state-of-the-art in that regard. 
We've diff 50 different tool types, excuse me, um, different individual tools of over a wide range. I mean, we're constantly upgrading and adding to the fab. You know, there's actually, because the fab is very efficiently run, there's already well-developed processes and equipments for climate control in place. Um, and there's a lot of interdependency between these tools and the actual, you know, the building and physical plant itself that, it, that houses them. And I think one of the great things about this is that it's a great example of what's called, often termed, an industrial brownfield site. You've got an existing plant. You know, a lot of the equipment may have depreciated, but you still want to keep it running. You know, it's very expensive to try and replace equipment and bring in new equipment. So the more mileage you can get out of existing equipment, the better. And those are often referred to as brownfield examples um, or sites, as opposed to when you deal with greenfield examples where, you know, the sensing measurement of equipment is already built into, into new equipment. Okay. So um, an example of what we're doing here, this is a pretty busy slide, but sort of, you know, on the bottom we have sort of existing sources of data, you know, whether it's the actual, you know, implanters, you know, the, um, the photolithographic equipment and so on, but the basic tool sets that are there today. There's facilities, you know, equipment on the facilities, um, you know, and then, you know, building management systems and so on. And then on the top we have a range of different external sensors around vibration, you know, environment sensors, you know, wire, you're actually measuring voltage and line conditions, vision systems as well because we do a lot of automated optical inspections. And all of these, you know, and these sensors are increasingly sensors that we build ourselves and provide for our customers. So we're using them in our plant. And there's various types of, you know, and data analysis and data collection systems that we pull together to in, in take that data. Um, so we're building, you know, in terms of the drivers on this, we're building on an existing control system. We want to improve, you know, the plant performance and equipment and start to add kind of predictive capabilities so we can predict, you know, when systems are going down. And part of the goals here with this are really to improve the productivity, you know, and be able to balance the lines when we've got, you know, moving product through our production lines. And the big thing is really around improving um, uh, yield and specifically reducing scrap events where you have to start over again if, if wafers get scrapped. So a couple of busy slides ahead. I'm going to really skip through them in the interest of time. Uh, the first step on this, today, you know, which we already have done, is kind of, you know, we look at sort of those various data logging capabilities on the systems today. We use Promise actually as the main sort of data, um, you know, system for running the whole plant. And really the first thing step really that we've implemented is to add kind of, you know, the line-based PLCs and controllers into the system, right? So this is an integration of a lot of existing disparate systems today. And then kind of, you know, the process we're at right now is, you know, it gets a lot more complicated as we build in, bring in some of the building management system data, the gas flowing, because a lot of gas systems and lots of very, you know, toxic chemicals and that they get used in making wafer, so um, wafers and silicon products. So gas managing gas flow is very important as well. And, and then finally, you know, using our own sensing systems, you know, looking at vibration power and so on. And the key thing here with this, I mean, really with the outcome we're, we're working towards with this is to be able to take all of this data um, and really kind of use it to predict an end of line yield or scrap event event, right? Because typically you don't know if you have a problem until you actually test the parts at the end of the line, right? And so the goal with this is to sort of pull all this data and really kind of, um, you know, be able to predict so you can scrap if, if necessary earlier and therefore, you know, restart. And that actually itself is, a, is, a, is very, very efficient um, or a lot more efficient, I should say. So if we kind of look at what we're, our status today as of, you know, last month, right? So we've actually done a lot of work in terms of the integration of the various systems, you know, uh, together. Um, now implemented some cases where production equipment will all automatically start to spin down in a controlled way if there's a, you know, if there's a problem or a sensor limit violation. You know, on the analytics side, I mean, we've got various trials underway. We're not an analytics company, right? I mean, it's not, say, on Forte. So we do partner, you know, for it to fill gaps in our own knowledge base. And certainly we're working with various vendors to sort of, you know, ev ev evaluate these, um, you know, different um, um, analytics tools. One of the key things about here is just the amount of volume of data, you know, that we have to deal with. I mean, when you look at analytics and you're dealing with thousands of columns of data, I mean, it's not a trivial problem for analytics engines to solve, right? So, and again, the key thing on this is really, um, you know, linking the end-of-line product results with any in-line problems that have along the way, whether it's sensor-related or actually, you know, logging from the machines themselves. And then I think other areas I should say as well, I'm not touching on these today, we've actually got separate projects going on where we're actually monitoring vacuum pumps. If you ever go into a sub-basement on a fab, there's a ton of these vacuum pumps along, around for shipping ga gases around the place. Um, we're doing remote fuse management. Another example, you know, these big plants have, you know, used these thermal fuses in many respects to, you know, to manage overloads and so on. A lot of times they're tested visually, right? Or, you know, not visually, you know, um, during a, a plant downtime, you go in and you measure the quality of the fuses. So we've got an imaging project underway where we thermally map, you know, changes in the fuse 
um, thermal characteristics over time as a way to anticipate um, um, you know, problems. And then finally, you know, another area we're working on is actually battery monitoring and UPS systems. So in our Philippines plant, electricity supply, I think, is a problem, right? So we have mar major US, U UPS systems in place, so in case there's a, an electricity fallout. Well, today, you know, the batteries are, you know, are monitored manually. Somebody goes around with a meter, and we've actually, we're building and actually, actually testing at the moment a, a system to do all that um, um, remotely. So some of the lessons learned. You know, the integration pieces around IoT are, you know, really key. You know, here we're integrating a lot of different systems together. From condition-based monitoring, I mean, there was an initial attempt to sort of keep the condition monitoring pieces separately from the process control, and we really found that at the end of the day, you needed to integrate those to really make the factory truly smart. Um, understand customer pain points. Again, in this case, the customer is our wafer fab and the man manufacturing folks. So really the key piece around having systems up and available and scrap prevention are much more bigger drivers than, say, ha reducing your inventory of spare parts, right? Which is often talked about as a, as a benefit of IoT. But in some cases, you, you're happy to have the spare parts on, in line if you can, you know, kind of um, deal with uh, scrap events and respond quicker. And then, you know, one of the things, we did a lot of wireless sensor deployment up front and, um, you know, found it you know, to be not as robust as we wanted. So there's different things we're doing now. We've learned from this about making our own wireless systems more solution or more robust. But the wired systems are very expensive to run. You know, actually the cost of actually having an electrician or a technician go in there and run wires in the sub-basements of fabs is actually turned out to be the most expensive part of this project when we were doing the deployments. Okay. And then finally, you know, the data analytics around data, um, you know, domain knowledge. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment. Um, security has been talked about a few times, but I think one of the things we did find that there were gaps in the security systems we've built on our sensors that we needed to address, which is not trivial when you're dealing with sensors that run off coin cell batteries and a very, very low kind of, you know, processing power available. So, um, so I think I want to say a moment now and say why do we do this, right? So I've talked about some of the benefits and the fab from the manufacturing perspective, right, about enhancing quality and on-time delivery. But another area as well is, you know, we're learning how to build more complex sensing and measurement systems, right? By doing this ourselves, we're getting a much broader perspective on the end systems and applications that use our products. We're learning more about the customer problems. And really, we're using our technology to, you know, solve our own problems first. So the whole eat your own dog food, you know, idea that was sort of initially pioneered by Microsoft and, you know, and many others. You know, we're actually testing, using our own systems, you know, um, ourselves. And, you know, I think another key point I'll just dump, jump to here, second last one, is that one of the things we've learned is that a lot of companies, big companies, have um, a lot of functions and capabilities locked up in their non-R&D areas. So, for example, in our case, you know, our manufacturing folks, and, you know, know an awful lot about analytics today because that's their job to manage yield, right? Um, in our IT group, we have, you know, lots of skills around security, networking, and server management. I mean, the key skill, skills that you need to kind of build IoT systems together or to, to market, and we're leveraging those capabilities today, right, as we kind of, you know, um, take on, um, you know, more and more of our, um, you know, of customer solutions. So let me talk about the condition-based monitoring. Um, so, you know, in rotating systems, you know, this is one key insight that came out of this. You know, we saw opportunities to sort of really improve the quality by which, you know, um, pumps and, you know, rotating machinery generally could be monitored. So one area is that, um, you know, if you look at motors today, you know, whether it's a pump, a fan, you know, there's various types of errors along the way, whether it's in bearings and couplings, imbalances in the loads and so on that can be monitored. A little hard to make this slide out here, but when we look at sort of how these artifacts, they show up very well in the frequency domain, right? So you see different harmonics, different tones start to start to show up, and which can be leading indicators of, you know, a potential problem, right? And, you know, an example of we have this sensor here today, this XL, which is a very wide bandwidth sensor we've developed just for this. And it's starting to replace even piezoelectric type sensors, you know, in um, some applications because the performance of MEM sensors now is getting, is getting good enough to do that. Um, I am an electronic engineer and we are analog devices, so no presentation will be complete without a signal chain. So to kind of show you some of the things we're doing here, you know, using our data converters, this is actually one of the parts we, we provide. And, you know, this is a case here where, you know, we're doing a bunch of signal processing on the edge, generating frequency content like I showed on the last plot, and then really looking at extracting insights from that right at the harmonics. Because one of the biggest challenges, I don't have time to get into this today, when you're dealing with analytics, everybody talks about analytics. But one of the things analytics tools are very picky about is how you format data going into it, into the tools. They don't tend to deal very well with um, time domain data. Right, so the ability to sort of pull out insights or, or key features of a data set that are important 
um, is, is really, really key here, especially in, simple, whoops, especially in simplifying um, the ETL workload, which is usually the front end of any kind of data an an analytic system. And so this is one of the areas where actually we don't have a demo here. Um, the demo that was supposed to be here showing this actually got stuck in Barcelona um, at IoT World Congress two weeks ago, so, um, or the week before last. Um, so, but I think the thing, one key thing as well we're learning is that um, vibration alone is not enough, right? Um, so there's an, an area we're specializing in um, in the electrical signature analysis um, area, ESA, right? So one of the things that happens is, is that in rotating systems, right, about a half the faults are electrical. They're not necessarily mechanical, okay? And mechanical vibration measurements is not always going to tell you about that, right? Also with me vibration measurements, I mean, we all know that machines wear in, right? So a vibration, um, um, a vibration response is going to naturally change over time. It's just part of the business. So you can't really depend on something that you sample at one point and then, you know, use that as a reference forever. So we're finding that, you know, actually monitoring the power on a, in, a, in, a, in a system is a really good way to, um, you know, kind of get, get greater insights. And there's a certain classes of faults that basically can't be detected um, by, um, you know, just mechanical vibration measurements alone. And looking at the power supply is a really good way to do this. So things like imbalances in the stators of motors or broken bars are good, uh, good examples. And, you know, I can, coupled, I think, with, um, you know, um, actually vibration analysis allows you to really augment and get a full, fuller view of what's going on with a system, okay? Now, um, you know, so here's a good example of this, right? Here's a, you know, a time domain waveform of, you know, the power, the current actually going into a motor right across the top here, the frequency domain. These harmonics around the edge here, um, you know, actually can give, are indicate, indicative of an actual broken rotor, rotor bar in the motor itself, okay, which would not necessarily be detected um, by vibration analysis until much more later, until you were much closer to a catastrophic event failure. Um, so I haven't said a lot about analytics so far, right, and basically because it's an area for us that's, you know, kind of, um, we're really working with third parties on this. But the key thing about this, when we think about the information journey, um, is that, you know, that, you know, there's various levels to this as we, you know, we're aware of, you know, you know, connecting sensors or tools up to a, um, allows you to, you know, ingest data and really kind of, you know, at least have data logs of what's going on so you can review later if there's a problem. But as you want sort of to have systems, you know, that move from being aware, you know, sort of start to react and be more pre pre um, pre um, predictive and pro proactive, there's lots of different sort of analytics tools that, you know, are available that, you know, and that are certainly emerging today to do that. Um, one of the things that's really key to remember about analytics, right, this is one of the areas that, um, you know, is really key for us, is that analytics is not going to tell you what to measure. And the garbage, the garbage in, garbage out kind of, you know, um, axiom still applies even in machine learning type systems. You know, an analytics tool or a machine learning tool is not going to tell you what you should be sensing, okay? And so this is one of the real drivers behind the type of application work that we do in IoT is we want to really know what's important for different applications about what you should be sensing. And so I've given you an example of some of the stuff around motors and our wafer fab um, today. Um, the one thing I will say that's also key for us as well is that, you know, some of the original ideas, and you see a lot of this today in early developments, um, is that, um, you know, there's a view that sensing doesn't matter. You just throw any sensor, send the data to the cloud, and you're done. And I think that when it comes to, you know, sort of, you know, looking at tr tr sen sensor performance and sort of compute capacity, you know, there's definitely a trend here that if you, the more sophisticated you need to be or want to be with your um, ana analytics and be becoming more proactive, you have to have trusted data, right? And it's not just about security, you know, data that has been tampered, that has not been tampered with. It's also about the quality of the data and the quality of the measurement. Because, for example, if you look at this FFT here, with a crappy sensor, your noise floor is going to be an awful lot higher, which is going to make it very, very difficult to discern some of the more subtle changes in, in, in that. So, so sensing is incredibly important. And then, you know, just to wrap up here, um, um, so in summary, I mean, I think, you know, IoT end-to-end -end solutions are really complex, and they're systems of systems, and, you know, we, we do an awful lot of work, with, you know, we're learning to work with partners, we're not going to supply the whole signal chain ourselves, so a lot of the companies, the big companies on this slide here, like GE, you know, Intel, Samsung, um, and Microsoft, I mean, um, Honeywell and others are companies we partner with today, you know, to bring solutions, um, and, you know, to, to market or at least that are using our components or we're, you know, we're working with. Um, you know, suppliers such as ourselves, we really need to learn more about complete applications that we participate in. It's not just enough to supply components anymore or individual pieces. You really need to understand how those are being used so you can sort of be proactive with your customers. 
and, and really start to teach them about you know, how, to, how to use and deploy this technology. Um, we're using our own manufacturing environments as a proving to be, an, is, it's really proving to be an effective way to learn while we actually improve our own outcomes like yield and scrap events and so on. And then, you know, we're le leveraging ex new cap our existing capabilities within our company as part of the R&D process. And I can't kind of straight to, um, you know, stress this enough. There are certainly papers out there, um, you know, certainly from the Harvest Business School, for example, that talk about the impact of IoT and generally connected technologies generally as having on business, right? They're transforming products. Um, you know, just our relationship with customers, but also the way we do business, right? And, you know, and I think that so leveraging kind of expertise from non-traditional R&D groups like manufacturing and IT and the product development process is an area that I think we've learned is vitally important, right, as we go forward. And, um, and I think, you know, building technology, the capability and a credible story on delivering values for customers has been a real key driver for us, right? We're not only are we creating sensors, but we're also using them in applications that are similar to what our customers are trying, are trying to do. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time today. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to hang around afterwards if anybody wants to, wants to chat. Thank you. Okay. May request Mr. Ashwini to please come up and I think he got the really tough slot, right? After lunch. Everybody uh, stayed almost. Yeah. Stayed. So, Thank so thanks everyone and thanks Kum for coming a long way to help us out here. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.